uh, or two. Who of you was stuck in traffic coming here? And you were driving? Cycling, Cycling stuck in traffic. Yes. Wow, because of cars, okay. Uh, so the rest of you walked and cycled here? Yeah, yeah? that's it? All right, all right. A little bit about myself. Uh, here I go. Uh, it's a mouthful, bicycle ambassador. Um, but it's nothing more than that I got the opportunity to share um, knowledge that I've gained from other people and work that I did to share that around the world, uh, helping cities take steps to make it more bicycle friendly. And every place is different, but also the same, because they involve people. And we have certain habits, we have certain conveniences, and whether you're Dutch or American or Luxembourg, again, um, it doesn't really matter. Have I, I have learned. So, we have more in common than we have differences, let me assure you. Um, yes, I have put in a nice little quote, I absolutely believe that. And um, I'm no cynic, but I'm a realist. So there you go. Uh, does this work? Uh, yep, yeah. ooh, delay. So I had a little play on words. It's cycle hack. First of all, by the way, guys, thank you for inviting me, I should say. Uh, it was a last minute thing. I could make it and I love doing this because it was asked before and I couldn't make it so I'm happy to be here. Thank you guys for getting me here. Love to talk to you. Uh, over the weekend, of course. Um, so yeah, I had a play on words. Hacking the message. Because Cycle Hack is about creating tools and ways of improving, um, locally improving or personally improving uh, cycling and the experience. and the convenience, anyway, uh, shape or form. Um, so I focus on the message, because often the message is the challenge. Because uh, people like to label other people, people like to demonize other people, people like to dismiss other people for all kinds of reasons. And cyclists are a special breed. In the, in the Netherlands we have a similar, similar, uh, similar word, that's features but it has a very different meaning than in English. It's normal. In, in the rest of the world, it's mostly an outgroup, so demonize an outgroup, it's easy. Anyway, I tried to... Oh, here we go. So this is the mission statement of CycleHack. I, I use this because it basically tells us a why, a how, and a what. But it's sort of like a mixed deal. It's sort of goes from, yes, we want to make it more sustainable, um, reducing barriers is very good, because that is in the way. Those, there are many barriers in the way of cycling. And the gas, grassroots approach is very nice, because demand starts from the bottom up. If we don't speak up, if we don't show that we want something, then it will never happen, right? Um, and I love this. So I'm very eager to see what's going on uh, this weekend. I've seen it on the website, I want to see it myself, so that will be awesome. Hopefully you will too. So I call it the policy hack, because messaging about cycling basically comes from the government, the local government. Uh, yes, and sometimes a cooperation with a local uh, bicycle institution or organization, grassroots mostly, but uh, the main um, driver of messages is the local government. So I looked it up. Uh, and I got some information from locals I know here, and basically the message is cycle and reduce CO2, CO2 emissions. And, um, yeah, that's kind of a mixed bag. Um, it's not really a, a great incentive, in my opinion, to get people cycling or give, provide them an incentive to consider it, because the environment doesn't necessarily provide the reality of that message. Oh. then I often get uh, the answer or the opinion man um, dude this is in Amsterdam you know you're on the red planet you're on Mars you're special you, you got some some DNA in there that's just whack and you smoke weed and all that <laughs> stuff it's ridiculous so we're not Amsterdamers um, okay well, even Amsterdam um, was in Amsterdam back in the day. And then they look at you, and you go like, okay, what's up? And 
I basically, I'm an historian, uh, that's my background, and I cannot help myself, so I take them back. And of course, I give them raw data, and that doesn't really entice people that much. So, let me show you by showing something else. This is a very busy shopping street, as you can see. This is 1910. It's in downtown area. It has two-way tram line. It makes, I mean, wait, I mean they have uh, turns in waiting for each other, but pedestrianized. 1910, uh, cycling was very much an elite uh, activity. Bicycles were expensive, so you don't see many. It hadn't, hadn't become a hit yet. So this is the Leicestraat. I'm going to take you through the ages of the Leicestraat. Okay, first some information, sorry. I'm a geek. Um, from the 1920s to the 50s was incredible, incredible growth in cities. That was because of the massive urbanization. Um, cycle growth. Uh, a lot of cheap bikes finally coming in from Germany. They were mass producing bikes. The, the prices went down, so the Dutch Finally, the masses got their hands on bikes and they used it and abused it. So it was kind of overwhelming. Not the car use yet, that was very expensive. But mainly, the, the, the nice parallel here is that I put down is that in the US, the bike craze already um, faded because of the, the, the rise of the car, that, because of the mass production of the car. So, the same way the mass production in Germany. Uh, kick-started the popularity in the Netherlands, it did the same in the US. And uh, keep that in mind when we go on. Um, yes, and Amsterdam wasn't bike friendly. I mean, the mayor tried to ban so much of their ability to move anywhere. Um, so yeah, uh, he preferred them. Um, of course he was well connected and he knew all his rich friends, so he wanted to, his friends to be able to drive anywhere they want. That's a true story. Here we go. 1924, as you can see, the rise of the bicycle. It's awesome, isn't it? All in suit. All just whatever they would wear walking, they would wear cycling. We still do now. Here we go. And you did too in Luxembourg and in New York and anywhere else. They all did this. It's the most normal thing ever. And you see, start, start to see the change. Cars coming in. Yep. The space isn't uh, changing. Then the 60s, miserable 60s. Absolutely miserable. Look what they did. They had side parking, two-way street for cars, and trams, and they gave the pedestrians a little sidewalk here. It's absolutely awful. And actually, uh, business went down. Even though economically, the Netherlands was doing really well, that, for one particular reason, I don't know what, maybe you could come up with the answer. It didn't do well. So in 1971, Amsterdam revolutionary, <laughs> in a revolutionary way, decided to pedestrianize the Leicestraat. I mean, shopkeepers were going nuts about it, but they pushed through. And it basically saved the place. This is what it looks now, just like in 1910. And um, differences only until a few, no, no, maybe 10 years ago, you could still cycle through. That was legal. But because it became such an uh, important pedestrianized area and it was extended, they said, okay, you can uh, arrive there, go by hand, you know, dismount, but that's it. And most people abide, but still Amsterdam, free spirits, and, you know, at night nobody goes there, so they will still cycle there. It's a give and take thing. So the policy act, historic context, yeah. The most powerful example I can give about this historical context and how it applies to any city I come to, or most cities I go to and talk, is that you need to find something relatable. I can still understand if you say, Amsterdam is still so different to me. I cannot see whatever you have happen here. I understand that and I appreciate it. That's no problem. But there are some essential things we all share. Well, many things we share. And that's children and the future of children. Because without it, um, I don't know where we're worth much. So, can you play this please? It takes nine minutes, but it's worth it. Thank you.
say too. It shows a lot of things, doesn't it? Um, yeah, that's what it, Amsterdam mostly looked like. It was one big car park and one big throughway. And given its uh, historic nature, it's a very historic town, of course, um, you can imagine the mayhem that uh, would ensue for just about anyone, whether you're old or young or whatever. Um, it's about um, quality of life. So, with, oh, hold on. Yeah, basically, this will stay. So, um, this is basically the, the end time of, it was basically the, the, the year that it, things were about to change. And there are different reasons for that. In that period uh, before that, there was a change in, uh, in, on many uh, levels. And some of them were planned, some of them weren't, of course. Um, spatial planning changed. Uh, big suburbanization, uh, suburbanization um, through to the 90s, huge increase in car ownership and usage, and literally cycling was pushed out of policy, national and local uh, policy. So, cycling infrastructure that was there was taken out to create more space for cars, etc., etc. And of course, naturally, people were not inclined to use the bike. Either they found it too dangerous, or um, they opted for the car themselves because it was so-called easier for them. It was made convenient. Uh, I'm sorry. That graph basically shows the, the uh, trend lines of uh, the cycle rate from the 1920s going up and then sliding down 75%. Cycle rate in the Netherlands plummeted by 75%. Not, many, not even the Dutch know that. About, about that. Um, yeah, so a few more. That whole children um, angle of mine is important, not just because uh, I like kids like the next one, it's more like it's the canary in the coal mine. You have to look at the signals. And what parents had was a very big canary because 455 kids died in the streets in a year. And to compare it to nowadays, even though traffic has more than doubled, car ownership has tripled. Hold on. It's now six on average. Still too much, but still. Um, we cycle more, so exposure to risk would be way more than in the 70s. Um, number of people driving um, has tripled, like I said. So. It's not inconvenient to drive in the Netherlands. It's very convenient, but still, how did we come about this? It's it's a big question. It's not one thing. It's not just it's not a cultural thing. It is culture is culture, but it's not an explanation of why this happened. I mean, in Copenhagen it happened. In Denmark it happened. At the same time, basically, stop the child murder. That's what it was called. Although well, this is the English translation. Parents rose up. A few people then organized parents, other people, organizations, grassroots, and they started a five-city campaign leading up to the national government. Basically, completely um, uh, occupying the cities in a big way. They did die-ins at Museum Square. They petitioned the government in stages. They held uh, funerals, they asked for better bike policy, they asked for the right reasons. The why was their children were dying. And who could possibly deny the call to end the death of children? And it was serious. So, we go back to using the bike as a sustainable means to change our living environment. Um, sustainability is a word that's been heavily used. And I use it uh, for work a lot, but maybe differently than most would like to. Um, in essence, the definition of sustainability is right there. To continue a defined behavior indefinitely. Well, we can all know the pros and cons of that. And I looked into the situation in Luxembourg. In a general manner, if it comes out harsh, I didn't mean to, but I'm a kind of a realist guy and I've been around the block, so I try to 
uh, put my experience and my my recognition of kind of elements of this city, the way it's designed, the way I see that the the attempts to integrate cycling into everyday mobility here, I look at that. And the general sense is that we're at, uh, Luxembourg is at a stage where the defined behavior is enabling perhaps growth, but growth is coming, is always coming, and I heard about um, the influx uh, of other people, not Luxembourgers, but other people, um, which is good, you need new flesh, new blood. Um, is enabling car use, whichever way. And once people have a convenience and they're used to it and they're entitled to it, then it's very hard to break the cycle. So, given that the message, the promotional message of this government, uh, the local government, is to aim to cut uh, CO2 emissions and proclaiming the bicycle as a priority, that's in the EU Trans, uh, com Transport Committee, um, the current approach is I'm honest, uh, I'm, I'm very serious, is bound to fail its citizens. Because we've seen it all over the place. This is a little funny between. I don't want to get too serious all the time. It's a wink and a smile, guys. Just a wink and a smile. So we all know the benefits, right? But I call them a mere byproduct. It's intrinsic to the bicycle. We don't need to reinvent it. We're trying to, every year you see the new tech innovations of trying to reinvent the bicycle. You can't. Look at e-bikes. They're very useful for certain demographics. People love them. They get better and better and better. But if you look at the whole product life cycle, whole product life cycle, we're absolutely crazy. If you, yeah, what we learned, what can we transplant? The Netherlands have learned that no matter how much we cycle, we can never mitigate um, that environmental sustainability, like pollution. We can never mitigate pollution if we don't cut the source of the pollution. It's, it's that simple. I, I can give you an example, just off the top of my head. Amsterdam is one of the most polluted, polluting cities in Europe. Word that last. So much concentration of harmful particles, it's unbelievable. And still we're slow to move, very slow to move, and that's understandable. There's also entitlement in Amsterdam for certain parts of mobility and industry and all that stuff. Somebody has to move in a big way and the rest will follow, but everybody's waiting for everyone. So, and the old thing that tech will bring, the safe, uh, uh, will save them. It's not always tech, it's looking at what you have and then organizing it differently, because we can, we've shown the history of it, we can change. Oh, hold on, I want to say something else. Um, these are a few good examples, indications, indicators. Just last week, uh, the Amsterdam Council uh, agreed on a new mobility plan. And you have to know that the conservative liberals are, the liberal conservatives, are in charge of transportation. And they had nixed another green mobility plan a few years ago. But data basically convinced everything. They did research on whether they should uh, cut off a, a big, important, uh, for car traffic, big, important road leading into the city up until the very heart of the city. And they gathered data, and they discovered that 65% of car traffic had no real reason to be there. 65, which pushed them over the edge and said, well, we'll ban almost all of them. Only residential access possible. And they rerouted, they filtered, they had another stepping stone. Because that ties into the other part of that neighborhood, which is also very important for pedestrianization, for livability, for pollution. Because again, Amsterdam is heavily polluted. Heavy industry, we have a port, cruise ships, we have uh, two-stroke mopeds by dozens who pollute more than 100 trucks, trucks combined. So it's an example. Another example is last year, I was on the BBC to explain this, University of Utrecht, of Utrecht um, did research, they researched 7,000 Dutch people who cycled three, at least three times a week. And they discovered for every hour they cycle, they live longer 
and they live an hour longer. And well, that's six months on average. It's a big deal. But what <laughs> they also quantified that whole thing, the, ben the healthy be health benefits. And that turned out with the Netherlands spending 500 million euros on average on infrastructure and policy enhancement, their return on investment in just health benefits, not the local economy, uh, other stuff, no, just the health benefits, returns 31 billion euros. I was amazed. I was absolutely amazed. Uh, and further, yeah, well, coming back to the children angle, the UN ranks Dutch children as happiest in the world, and they established that um, independent mobility from average the year seven, eight, going to school, going to their friends, going around the block, to the play playground, independent from their parents, plays a huge part. A huge part. And if you cut that, cut that cord to cycling at that early age, they will never pick it up. That habit will rarely come back. Here we go. Barriers. Well, they were mentioned. And yes, we have had these same barriers. And it took us some time. But in essence, what we have now was built in less than 15 years. Literally, around the country. You can cycle from one side to the other with your child or an older, pe older person can, a senior, 85, no problem. You can cycle across the country without even thinking about danger. So, what we learned is that it's not a versus thing. It's absolutely uh, important to uh, emphasize that it's not a versus thing. People are not a pedestrian. People are not a cyclist. People are not a driver or a busser or whatever they are, a trammer. They are not. We all use different things. The same way that the Leidsestad context is very interesting because most people who are pedestrian are counted as pedestrians in Amsterdam. Usually, 70% of them arrive by bike. So, what is that? We call that dual mobility. What do you call that? It's very simple. We just use what's most convenient. And in Amsterdam, we provide the ways to make that as convenient as possible. So, it's not a versus thing. There will still be cars. We don't hate drivers. It's just that. The amount of space they require, the whole facilitation of public space for cars is incredible. The cost, the subsidization of that. Um, if you look at the real numbers, it's incredible. Well, let, let me give you an example from the top of my head. In the city center, 70% of all trips are by bike. And then mixed, they go walking, whatever. But 70% of arrivals are by bike. That's good. Cool. That's very good. 25% of all traffic in city center is car. It's car traffic. Yet, that 25% of car traffic gets almost half of all public space. And 70% of all the trip, uh, the, the modality that gets, uh, that provides those trips, get only 11%. While we are considered a bicycle friendly city, where we get 70% of traffic, there are traffic. We give them 11%, which gives you an idea how much, how far we will go to facilitate a means of, uh, of, um, of um, transportation that is absolutely useless in a city like Amsterdam. But we're still, we still have to come to terms with that. Another learning point is you cannot get more than 5%. If you want more than 5% cycle rate, you have to think about a continuous network. A, even though it's mediocre, as long as it's connected, but needs to be a stepping stone. You need to have that vision to go, if we're really serious about this, it needs to be integrated in the design plans, in the, in the urban planning, in your spatial planning. You need to recognize that we work with our architects as well. Architects trying to integrate their architectural thinking into the mobility of people. Let me, let me, one anecdote, all real estate agents advertise in Amsterdam with that line only 10 minutes cycle away from the center, as an, as a, as an example. It is, a, it is a selling point like nothing else, because it's, it's quality of life, it's convenience. Anyway, 
And then, finally, campaign and promote this uh, with messages that relate, not relates, relate to reality. Because if you, that's what they did in London, they made posters with blue skies and happy people while they had record, record after record of people dying on their bikes in the city. The reality didn't match the promise or the incentive to go cycling. It was absolutely really good. So they were really ridiculed. Boris Johnson was ridiculed. And he's still mumbling on, but he's gone. Anyway. Um, it's so important because people will catch you on. It, even if they are inclined to follow your lead and go, yes, I'll cycle. They will still have so much conflict on their way that they will give up eventually. If, it does, if the infrastructure and the, the means of going there doesn't match your message. You can give it a label. But cycling is really demand driven. It's not supply. It will never come top down. It will always come bottom up, no matter how you spin it. And it is, um, it is my belief that there are so many assets in play that you can use, as in knowing what people want, the dormant majority who would like to, who would like to participate in this whole thing, that is called cycling, or using it in everyday life, but are dormant because we don't know much about them. So yes, it takes a lot of energy and time, but you can actually, actually do something with that. It's a powerful tool. Uh, I did a little comparison. Density as a term it doesn't say very much. It's about spatial and urban planning, moreover, but um, there are differences, but there are kind of correlations that are interesting. Maybe you can spot them. Anyone? Which one stands out? What? No. No. Sorry. Not to my opinion. Well, okay. Two things stand out. But that's the obvious part, right? I'm looking for a correlation that is, okay, there we go, uh, let me see, am I doing it right? No. Um, 741, okay, it's one minute left, all right, all right, all right, anyway, just look it up, it will be provided for you, the video will be up and the document will be up, it's about car ownership per thousand people. Yes, we have change resistance. We've seen it in the video. We've seen it, uh, we see it in policy, we see it in the politics. It's nothing new. It's nothing new. If politicians would identify or know about that, more, know more about that silent majority, you would have a power block that would convince anyone. I'm sure. But it's about that cooperation. Systemic change, that's what we're, uh, change resistance, that's what we're talking about. And that's, you can apply that with anything, it's nothing new. But it's good to point it out and know that it's a bigger picture. It's not just about bikes. It's, it's a much bigger picture. So, oh, it almost disappears. So I have a policy hack message that I like to share. So sort of uh, going on with the cycle hack mission statement. Um, I turn it into this. Luxembourg's mission is to improve its citizens' quality of life by meeting the challenges of growth in urban mobility, congestions, pollution, and safety at home. This will benefit all environmentally, economically, and socially. Sounds like a given, but nobody's saying it that much. How? Luxembourg City forges a mobility plan that, which busts the versus paradigm and deprioritizes driving. And there are many incentives to deprioritize driving and cut down. Many, many proven concepts. What? Take proven concept, translate locally, build commitment, and redesign the future of your children. And with that, let's see if it responds. Oh, here we go. I end my presentation. Thank you very much.
example of, uh, of the pipe shows that, um, in effect, what was the catalyst for change was um, civil disobedience, yes. right? Um, now, I'm not sure that sits very well with the way Luxembourg understands itself and Luxembourgish culture. I'm going to but kids it, can get away with anything. <laughs> but but even even if it is kids sort of that that were at the core of the message, do you think that there is another way to foster change, or does it have to go via the means of of someone putting their foot down and saying no more, no further, we want change now? Right. Well, then I get back to the point I made in the last uh, ten minutes, which is gather the information uh, of the silent majority. And that it doesn't have to be a revolutionary thing. It, it's just asking about the needs, asking what, about what their aspirations are. And I do that all the time, and I'm, every time I'm, I'm amazed by what comes out of it. Also, if you ask the question, how would you like to participate? How would you like to help? The same way that this cycle hack has emerged like this, you can do that with the solid majority. It's, it can be a little bit of uh, an attribution or, or bigger thing. It's up to these people, but as long as they're recognized and they're listened to and you gather that data, the same way that you cannot do policy without data. Even in Amsterdam, they do some policy without actually having the data. So it's madness. So that, that would be my answer. So the policymakers in uh, the Netherlands, public buildings, your political chambers, do they all have um, a big fat parking underneath these oh, institutions? Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, so how do, you, uh, how do they play with that then? First step, the electric car. So the subsidy trickles on and then it's all like, oh we're doing something great. Um, we're changing our half of our fleet to electric cars. Of course, uh, it's not like the majority of civil workers have a car. That's absolutely not true. But the higher ups, management, all that stuff, they're either driven around, driven around um, because they have managerial uh, pr uh, uh, tasks and everything. Um, but quite a lot, just like the mayor traditionally always arrives by bike. It's not just a token thing. Like a minister of uh, of uh, so uh, social affairs would not touch a car; would rather just cycle to work. That's that's still there, um, but. Whether it's Italy or here or in the Netherlands, there are always abuses, and it's just a matter of how you get away with it. And you know, you know how that game is played. We're we're no saints, absolutely not. And uh, and and some people don't care, absolutely. Anyone else? Anyone else? That's it. No. <laughs> Okay, so it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, it's the irony of Amsterdam. Uh, it's sort of like a, a boomerang coming back to Amsterdam, like 20 years later, because they they even call it the world's first bicycle mayor, which is not true. Um, but hey, let's have a game. No, it's it's basically a um, public-private project. It's part of Fab City, funded by the. Um, your uh, Dutch uh, Dutch presidency of the EU, EU for six months, but it tries to tries to enhance innovation and policy, uh, participatory policy. So they came up with finally, after all these years, we're going to have a bicycle mayor, but we want you to sign up, as in present yourself, and then have a vote. So all the people who have been active on a grassroots level are all all coming into the fray, of course. And yes, it's fun. I, I know many of them. And I considered going uh, running, but um, now with my company, I have a different mission, which goes beyond just being the liaison between the people of Amsterdam and the city hall. Been there, done that. I think they can do a great job, but I have bigger plans. So thank you for uh, asking that. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Last question. That's it. Okay. Thank you for thank your you. attention, guys. I'm looking forward to all the hacks this weekend. Hope you'll see.